everyone and welcome to a video you have all been probably waiting for. But before you watch the rest of this video, go back and watch the video about Aatrox, otherwise you will miss on a lot of information. Now today we will have a look at the story Twilight of the Gods. It is a story that explains what happened to the Darkin during the Great Darkin War. Hope you enjoy it. They came to a dead city in the mountain's shadow under cover of night. Battle hosts of a thousand warriors, each bearing bloody totems that told of the ancient lineages of the Sunborn Ascended who led them. The city and the bones of its people had long ago become one with the desert, and it was impossible to tell ash and bone from sand. Only its tallest towers remained above the dunes, broken spires that sang mournfully when the winds blew from the realms beyond the mountain. Upon a broken plinth stood two trunkless legs of stone, the cruel visage of a half-buried avian head laying in the sand beside them. In a long distant age, an event of great moment had taken place in the valley where the city would later be built. It had marked the beginning of Shurima and set in motion its ending. None remembered that day, save the god warriors who led their hosts towards the city's jutting ruins. Those same god warriors had put the citizens to the sword in the wake of their emperor's betrayal. And with its people murdered, they had seen the city burned and its name hacked from every steel and obelisk that remained standing. Yet these acts of extermination were for naught but futile spite. Futile because the child who had been taken as a slave from the city was long dead. And in life he had no use for memory of his birth. His act had destroyed the empire and sundered their brotherhood. And so the god warriors buried Nerizameth and its people to ash. The passage of deep time had stolen the Golden Scroll's luster. Much like us all, thought Tanari. He drew a clawed finger down the etched list of names and numbers. A meticulous scroll of ties from the newly established trading port of Kazun in the north. Newly established. Kazun had been a city of men for centuries. Their savage tongue already debasing its name into something new and ugly. The scholar might have found the scroll's contents interesting, but the only worth it held to Tanri was the tangible link it provided to a time when the world made sense. The room had once been a hall of records, its marble walls lined with shelves and stacked with scrolls recording tributes due to the emperor, accountings of his wars and long lists of his deeds. It had been a cavernous space, but the roof had caved in centuries ago, and sand filled most of the subterranean space. He felt a change in the air and looked up from the studies. Misha stood in the doorway, dwarfed by its dimensions, though Tanri's black furred skull would brush its lintel, where he's still able to stand upright. Her frame was slight, fragile even, yet Tanri sensed she possessed depths not even he had fully grasped. Gold blonde hair, like the man found in the cold north, spilled around her shoulders. Her features were youthful, but her eyes, one rich blue, the other twilight's purple, held wisdom beyond her years. She wore thin silks, colorful and entirely unsuited to the desert, tied at the waist with a thin rope, from which hung a single golden key. A vivid pink scarf coiled around her neck, and she twisted its tasseled ends through her fingertips. They are here, she said. How many? Nine hosts, nearly 10,000 warriors. Tanri nodded, drawing his tongue over his yellowed fangs. More than I expected. She shrugged and said, They all need to be here. Too much blood has been spilled over the centuries, he said. Too much hate unleashed. The idea that there could be peace between us is anathema to many of them. Misha shook her head at such foolishness. So many have already died in this endless war. You have managed to kill more of your kind than even the abyssal horrors did. A rebuke of her flippant tone died on Tanri's thick tongue. She was right after all. And wasn't that why he summoned his kin? The moment Azir fell, a war between the Sunborn was inevitable, said Tanri, putting aside the scroll and rising from his study of ancient history. With him gone, the scale of our ambition was too great for any of us to lead. So many visions of what the future needed to be, but all of us too broken to realize them. Then perhaps you are not so different from mortals, after all. Once he would have killed anyone who voiced such a thought, but the centuries of war and the colossal scale of the slaughter they had unleashed was a testament to the truth of it. 
Dandri had no clear recollection of Misha entering his service. The lives of mortals were so fleeting. He barely noticed when one died and another one took their place. But Misha had drawn his notice more than any other. Her defiant insolence was part of it. But there was more to it than that. She had an insight into the minds of mortals that he and all his kind lacked since their trading of humanity for greater power. Tanri had last walked as a man so very long ago. He barely remembered the sensations of a mortal, or the awareness of time's inexorable march. Ancient magic and the forge of the sun disk had remade him, brought the crude matter of his mortal flesh into that of a god. A flawed and broken god, but divine nonetheless. His bronze armored form had been panther-like, bowed by age and war, but still mighty. The fur of his upper body had once been lustrous black, but both his snout and limbs were feathered with grey, and he had reshaped himself as best he could. Tanri's gaze had cowed entire armies, but one scarred socket now contained a cracked ruby, the other a slitted amber eye, roomy with despair. His spine was twisted after an axe blow taken during the battle of the river Kalik. A blow so ferocious that not even his fiery regenerative powers had been able to fully undo the damage. He lifted a weapon from the table. A magnificent four-bladed Chalikar. He felt the perfect balance of its killing edges. But more than that, he felt the weight of expectations it embodied. He sighed and slung it in his shoulder harness before limping over to Misha. Even hunched by the ravages of time and old wounds, Tanri towered over her. The War of the Sunborn, though others were calling it a different, darker name, had excavated a grievous toll of lives on her kind. Yet she had no fear of him. Sometimes he sensed a measure of pity from her, at other times a withering contempt. She placed a tiny hairless hand in his massive pawed fist. You are still a god warrior, Tanari, she said. Remind them of what that one stood for and you will win them over. And if they don't listen? She smiled. Simple. You kill them all. So we have two characters marching into the ruins of our forgotten city. City we later learned is the birthplace of Zerath, the slave who doomed the empire. Now we have two characters, Tanri and Misha, an ascended warrior and someone who very closely resembles Zoe, the aspect of Twilight. Tanri is also wielding Chalikar, the legendary blade of Setaka, and it seems like the two of them have some kind of plan to deal with the remaining Sunborn. So let's see how it turns out. His life bearers were waiting for him in the sand sunk antechamber. Once they had been queens and the rulers of mortal empires, but in the face of Tanri's invincible war host, they had pledged their swords to him. Better to fight alongside a god warrior than to be crushed by one. Tushpa bowed as he approached, her muscular arms knotted with tattoos and branded with jade torques. Defiant but loyal, she had been the last to offer her blood. Sulpe was desert born with a lineage that reached back to the time before Azir's father. She stamped her long spear at the sight of him. Her shaven scalp was scarified in a grid and pierced with gold beads at every ridged intersection. Idri Mai, proud and sturdy, held her long hafted axe at her shoulder. Its double leafed blades heavier than most men could lift. She was a queen from the east whose mother and grandmother had fought for him. Her pale skin was like ivory. Her long black hair hung with silver hooks. Tanri stood before the three warrior women. They were not his bodyguards. He had no need for lesser beings to protect him. Instead, they served as a symbol of his will, how he could dominate proud warriors who wanted him dead, and were skilled enough that they might actually be able to hurt him. His brothers and sisters of the fallen brotherhood would bring their life bearers too, but none were so fierce as his. Even so, none of the women looked at him in the eye as he spoke. To meet the gaze of a god warrior was to die. I have seen many life bearers over the centuries of my existence, but you will be my last said Tanri. He scanned their faces for a reaction, but years of servitude had purged them of the weakness of emotion. They were as expressionless as the fallen statues littering the remains of the dead city. I know this with complete certainty. As much from the patient gleam in your eyes as the nightmares that rip through my skull when Misha's elixirs wear off. You are all loyal, but you hunger for my death. 
Was that a flicker in the eye of Tushpa? Once he would have gnawed the flesh from her bones at such a lapse in control. But his appetite for slaughter had waned over the centuries. I cannot blame you, he continued. What does my kind offer yours but death and horror? An age ago the Sunborn saved this world at a terrible cost. But now we have brought it to the edge of ruin. The ascended host's days of glory are long past. Overshadowed by the darkness of our warring and the all too fleeting memories of you mortals. Bitterness tainted the last of his words, tempered only by the knowledge that he and his brethren had brought this upon themselves. Overweening pride, war damaged psych, and ancient feuds alloyed to forge the blade that sundered their chains of duty. Tanneri let out a shuddering breath. For over a thousand years he had fought against this moment, but now it was upon him. He knew death was nothing to be feared. If you live through this night, you will greet the dawn free. When the sun rises, return to your people and tell them what you saw and heard here. He turned away. Misha, is everything prepared? Yes, they are waiting in the amphitheater. Tanuri nodded. Then let us end this. The life bearers are leaders of armies. Think of them like the kings and queens of their tribes and cities. The Ascended keep them not to have an army to fight for them, but to have people that follow them, to prove themselves to be the true leader. The space had not been designed as an amphitheater. It had served as Nerissa Mesh's marketplace, but Tanri's slaves had carved it from the desert's embrace, and his magic had shaped it with heat so intense it vitrified the sand. Now it was an arena of blown glass, sea green and numinous iridescence, its surface captured a soft moonlight and reflected it back in floating veils of silver. Tanri entered through a sweeping arc shaped like a frozen instant in the life of an ocean wave. Tension thickened in the air, as was only to be expected when the gods gathered their battle hosts. Ten thousand men and women filled the tiered heights of the amphitheater, the champions of the god warriors assembled below. No blades were bare but all were ready to unleash an orgy of slaughter at their liege's command. Tanri swept his gaze around his fellow sunborn brothers and sisters once united by unbreakable bonds of love and duty that were, in time, revealed to be as brittle as glass. Unimaginable power had wrought their bodies, drawn from a realm beyond comprehension to sculpt their mortal flesh in ways none living now could recreate. But our minds are still mortal, he thought, and shockingly weak. Syphax's gaze offered understanding, Zygentus radiated disgust, Zuyan seethed with outright contempt. It had been Zuyan's axe that crippled Tanuri at Kalik. The Kelonian headed god warrior spat on the ground as Tanuri limped to the center of the amphitheater. Shabaka and Shabake, the raven feathered seer twins, did not even look up. Too engrossed in casting auguries with scrimshot finger bones. Valiva watched Tanuri with the same haughty disdain that her brother always did. The one member of their sundered fellowship he was relieved had not attended. Sebotaru the wolf paced back and forth, impatient to be done with this conclave. His battle host ravaged the far north and the lands over the western seas. Of all of them, Sebotaru was closest to breaking the bloody stalemate. Naganeka of Zorita watched from within her hooded cowl. A long scaled rope draped over the coiled length of her body. Her venom blinded life bearer stood ready to convey her words, should she actually deign to utter any. None of them had heard her sibilant whispers in over 500 years. Only Enkai offered respect. He came forward, his skin patterned with new vivid stripes of orange and black. Where Tanri was bent and bowed, Enkai wore his great age with pride. Eyes undimmed and strength unbroken by the long ages he had made war. Long ago they had climbed the golden steps to the sun disk together, hand in hand as its searing light infused them with celestial power. Enakai had borne Tanri's wounded body on the retreat from Ikathia, fought as his brother in the mud at Kalik, and faced him as an enemy at the glacier port. Live as long as we do and the wheel will turn many times. Enakai took Tanri's paw in his. Tanri. Enakai. No more needed to be said. The span of many lifetimes worth of experience, joy, loss and heartache were contained in their exchange of names. They were beings raised up as gods. Inconsequential words were beneath them. 
and a guy's eyes narrowed as he caught sight of the weapon slung behind Tanri's back. He opened his mouth to speak, but Tanri gave an imperceptible shake of his head. I hope you know what you are doing, Enakai murmured, returning to his place at the edge of the amphitheater. Tanri took a breath. He had rehearsed this moment many times over the years, understanding that a single wrong word could end this before it began. His skin were god warriors, and had all the haughty arrogance and quick temper common to beings of such ego. Brothers and sisters, he said, the magically crafted acoustics carrying his word throughout the amphitheater. Such a gathering of the Sunborn had not happened since the drawing of the Thousand before the walls of Parnessa. He saw knots, that vivid memory stirring the dimmed embers in their souls of what they had once been. Now build on that, speak as if to each one of them. I look around, and I see power. He continued, every word delivered with passion and belief. I see gods where once walked mortals, beings of noble aspect, mighty and worthy of devotion. Some call our ancient brotherhood sundered. They use the ancient tongue to name us Darkin. But to see you here gives a lie to that word. Tanri paused, letting his flattery wash over them. It would be empty to most, for chores of tortured subjects sang praises day and night to them, on pain of death, but it might open enough of the rest of them to be won over. You all remember when we marched shoulder to shoulder, when Setaka led our ascended host to push the Emperor's realm to every edges of the world. I know I remember it well. It was an age of glory, an age of heroes. Sebotaru. You and I rode dragons of twilight to the piercing summit of the world, where all time is as one, and witnessed the creation of the universe. He turned and held a hand out to Syphex. Syphex, my brother. We waged war on the abyssal monsters when they poured from the ocean rift on the eastern coast. We fought for ten days and nights, to the very limits of endurance. But we drove them back. We triumphed. Syphex nodded and Tanri saw the memory of that war ripple through his scaled flesh in waves of purple, black and red. I do not speak of that time, said Syphex. His many eyes wailed in smoke. Seven thousand golden warriors of Shurima died on the red shore. Only you and I returned alive. Yes, we paid a terrible price for that victory, brother. In flesh and in spirit. But what a fight it was! Mortals renamed the ocean in horrors of our deeds that day. Syphax shook his head. Your memory has omitted the horrors we saw that day, Tandri. Keep your talk of glory. I will not hear it. When I close my eyes, I still hear the screams of those we lost. I relive how those things killed them. Worse, how they wiped them from the world and devoured their very souls. So spare me of your gilded recollections. I do not recognize them. Yes, they were days of blood and... Yes, it is likely I glorify them, said Tanri. But I speak of how the world should know us and remember us. As mighty heroes, bestriding the world at the head of invincible armies and commanded by an undying emperor who... But Azir did die, snapped Zuyan, planting his mighty long axe hard enough to crack the glass beneath. He died and without him at our head, the Sunborn fell to war. What went before is now dust and ashes. It is meaningless. So if you think reminding us of golden memories will end this conflict, then you have fallen further into madness than any- Reminding us of what we once were is only a part of my reason for bringing you here, said Tanri. Then state your purpose, or let us get back to killing one another. Tanri tried to stand upright, but failed when the twisted bones in his back cracked like a bent branch. Pain shot up his spine like a raking claw of a voidborn terror. It is the old wound, Zuyan, he said. It never really healed. You remember, at Kalik. Of course I remember, Cripple, snarled Zuyan. I remember every blow I have struck from the moment I stepped from the light of the Great Disc. There are none of us here who cannot speak of great deeds or betrayals at the sight of those we once called brothers and sisters. You and I, we held the line where Ikathia once stood. You saved my life more than once. Those days are gone now, snapped Sebotaru, the words mangled by the growing disfigurement of his jaw. And in the past they must remain. Why? Tanri demanded, rounding on him. Why must they remain in the past? 
Are we not the ascendant of Shurima? We are not mere avatars, we are gods. What is reality but what we decide it should be? Any of us could rule this world entirely. But instead we have fallen to petty squabblings, waging wars for reasons that no longer make sense, even to the few of us that could still name them. He paced, his tone hectoring and judgmental, despite himself. Zygentus, you believed we should rebuild from the ruins, to continue Azir's legacy. Enkai, you sought to establish a new kingdom. Valiva, you and your brother saw spite in every eye, and sought vengeance for slights real and imagined. Oh, they were real. She hissed, her alabaster skin threaded with violet veins, and her venomous spine standing erect at her shoulders. Tanori ignored her. Each of us saw a different path into the future, but instead of using our sunborn powers and working together to achieve something divine, we fought like scavengers over a fresh corpse. Yes, Setaka was long dead, and we will never see her like again. Yes, Azir was betrayed and our empire lay in ruins, its people scattered and frightened. Shurima needed a strong leader to guide its rebirth, but all it was left with was us. Broken monsters who had stared into the abyss too long and felt its horror twist their minds to madness and self-destruction. So instead of rebuilding, we fought for scarps of a dead empire, while burning the rest of the world to the ground. Even now, we would sooner see the extinction of all life rather than find common purpose. Alone we are mighty, but together there is nothing we cannot do. Nothing. If we want it, we could storm the celestial gates, leave this ashen world behind and forge a new empire beyond... Tanneri's voice dropped, laden with regret. But we do not. We do what lesser beings do. We kill each other in a war that lasted many times longer than any we fought before. And then his voice rose soaring to far reaches of the amphitheater. But it does not have to be that way, not anymore. Tanri reached back over his shoulder and unslung the Chalikar. The murmur of shock rippled around the amphitheater at the sight of the ancient weapon. You all remember this, he said. It is the weapon of Sadaka, greatest and noblest of us all. Brought from beyond the mountain and raised aloft at Shrima's birth. It is the blade that will one day be borne by Shivunas Alair, the bringer of rains. In their hands it will be a weapon of great destruction, or a symbol of unity. He held out the Chalikar for his fellows to see. Its edges glittered gold, shaped by cosmic forces beyond this world, by powers not even the wisest of Shurima understood. Tanri saw their reverence, their awe and pride, but most of all he saw their desire to possess it. Zuyan took a step towards him. Of course it would be Zuyan. The god warrior spun his axe, and Tanri remembered the awful pain of its obsidian blade splitting his armor and smashing his spine to shards. I will kill you and take it from your dead hand, said Zuyan, a wide grin splitting his beaked skull. Will that make me the leader? His kidiness carapace bounced at his shoulders, studded with outgrowth of bone spikes and iron blades. Even in his prime, Tanuri could not best him. But Kalik was many centuries ago, and Tanuri had learned new tricks since then. Are you going to fight me with that? Zuyan asked, pointing to the Chalikar with his axe. No, said Tanuri, turning to hand it to Misha. Its weight was almost too much for her to bear. But she winked, and again he sensed capricious amusement from her, as though the sight of gods about to fight was amusing to her. Zuyan sneered. Then what? You will face me unarmed? Is that what it is? You want to die here, in the sight of all your fellow gods? Not that either. No matter. I care nothing for your reasons, said Zuyan. I will finish what I began at the river. His charge was like an avalanche, a rumbling inexorable thunder that was as deadly as it was inescapable. Tanuri had seen entire phalaxes broken by it. Giants toppled and fortresses' gates smashed asunder. Tanuri dropped to one knee and placed his hands flat against the amphitheater's glassy floor. He felt currents of magic running through its structure, golden threads of power linking him to every living being that stood upon it. The mortals were like tiny sparks rising from a fire, but the god warriors were newborn sons of roiling magic. He tapped into their power, just as Misha had taught him. 
He drew out a measure of cursed prescience of Shabaka and Shabake, feeling their alien senses twist within him. The lizard swiftness of Syphax surged through his ancient body, the rage of Zygentus, and Enkai's sense of righteous purpose. Danori closed his eye, now knowing where Zuyan's charging blow would land. He swayed aside, the blade smashing a hair's breadth from his throat. Zuyan's passing was like a thunderstrike, and Tanori swung around, grasping one of his attacker's crueling shell horns. He vaulted onto Zuyan's back and his former brother roared in fury. The god warrior rolled, trying to throw Tanori, but his grip was too tight. The seer twin's unwitting gift allowed Tanori to anticipate every wild bucking move his foe made. Zuyan reversed his grip on the axe and swung it over his shoulder, like a barbed whip of a lunatic penitent. Tanori rolled aside as the blade smashed down, cleaving a deep and gory through in Zuyan's unnatural armor. The sunborn bellowed in anger, wrenching the blade from his hardened flesh in a welter of blood. One of his horns hung by sinew threads, and Tanori ripped it from the carapace. Ivory white and curved like a scimitar, its tip was sheathed in iron and needle sharp. Zuyan slammed into the wall of the amphitheater with a hammering impact that smashed it to spitting fragments of razored glass. Scores of mortal bodies stumbled into the arena, only to be crushed underfoot by the struggling god warriors. Zuyan hurled Tanri from his back. He landed hard on the ground, still clutching the sharpened horn. Zuyan turned and swung his axe down in an executioner's strike, but Tanri dove aside. The floor exploded in knives of glass. Instead, Zuyan's gnarled foot stomped down on his chest, pinning him to the floor. He felt his ribs crack, a shard punching into his lung. The weight was colossal, easily capable of crushing him like an insect. The Chalikar will be mine! Zuyan shouted. The god warrior's leathery helmet-like skull extended from his armored carapace, his neck pale and thick with pulsing arteries. Soulless black eyes bulged at the promise of slaying yet another rival. As he had promised, Zuyan meant to finish what he had begun at the banks of the river Kalik. No, grunted Tanri through the blood-flecked fangs. It won't. He unleashed a surge of newly learned power, unknown to the rest of his kind. He blinked. A terrible sensation of hurtling through an unending vortex overcame him. A tunnel surrounded by hideous monsters that lurked just beyond the threshold. The sensation lasted a fraction of a second only but felt like an age. He opened his eyes and he was once again atop Zuyan as the deadly axe arced towards the ground. A hard bang of displaced air echoed behind him as the fleeting portal closed. Tanri raised the bloody horn high overhead and plunged it down into Zuyan's eye. The tip punched deep into the god warrior's skull, Tanri's inhuman strength driving the entire length of the horn into the mass of Zuyan's brain. It was a ferocious killing blow. But Zuyan still stood, his ancient flesh not quite ready to admit that it was dead. Tanri leapt clear as the towering god warrior crashed to his knees with the sound of a mountain toppling. Zuyan rolled onto his side, his remaining eyes staring at his killer with mute incomprehension. His beaked mouth still moved, but no words came out. Tanri gulped in breaths that heaved in his blood froded lungs. He heard Misha squeal in the light clapping like a proud teacher pleased at the student's wild success. The sound sickened him. Even if things had gone exactly as planned, he had suspected he would have to kill at least one of his brethren, but had not relished the prospect. He and Zuyan had never been close, but they had fought side by side for the glory of Shurima, back when the sun blessed them and filled their bodies with strength. He knelt beside his fallen opponent and laid a third hand on his head. Blood glistered with the light of dragon rod stars. I'm truly sorry, brother, he whispered. A roar of anguish went up from Zuyan's champions. Not in mourning for their fallen god. Zuyan was too hated for that. Not even in hunger for vengeance. The roar was for their own forfeit lives. Murderer's blades slipped from the sheets of the warbands to either side of them. The god warriors had taught their slaves well. Men without a god to protect them were nothing more than vermin to be exterminated. Or so the teachings had always been. Hold! shouted Tanri. Champions, stay your blades! These warbands were not his, but he was sunborn, and the awesome authority in his voice halted them in their tracks. His fellow god warriors stared in open-mouthed wonder at what Tanri had done. 
Naganeka of Zurita slid forward and lowered her upper body to study Zuyan's cooling corpse. Pale smoke was lifting from his flesh, celestial energies already fleeing the mortal meat of his body. She pulled back her hooded cowl, revealing her many hypnotic eyes rimmed with ash and scaled lips overhung by long ebony fangs. She bent over the wound in Zuyan's back and her tongue flickered out to taste his death. Rast will be disappointed, she said, her voice wet reptile hiss. He had sworn to slay Zuyan himself. Her venom-blinded lifebearers shuffled behind her, unsure of what to do now that the revealed goddess had spoken aloud. The others came forward warily. Enkai and Syphax watched Tanuri with newfound respect. The others fixated on Zuyan's death, but they had seen Tanuri do something impossible, even for a god warrior. Shabaka and Shabake circled the corpse. Their stunned wings fluttered in agitation. They wore the smell of death like a shroud. The corruption that touched them all was most obvious in those two. Onyx eyes, eyes that had seen too much, darted back and forth. Told him he would die today, didn't we, sister? Said Shabaka. They never listen, do they? Shabake replied. Shabaka giggled. No, no, never listen to the mad ravens. What do we know? Only everything. You foresaw this? Demanded Zygentus. Yes, yes. Saw him get too close a look at the horn of his. Told him so, but he just laughed. Not laughing now, is he, brother? No, sister. What, what else have you seen? Asked Syphax. The seer twins huddled together, whispering and tossing the small bones back and forth between them. Their minds have been shattered during the battle to seal the great rift at Ecathia. No one, not even a god warrior, could meet the gaze of the titanic entities who watched and dwelt within the abyss without their sanity unraveling a little. Shabake frowned. Future too tightly woven to know and too many possible outcomes from the now to see any clearly. Shabaka added. Not for sure. All of us may die today, or just some, said Shabake. Or maybe none. Maybe you kill Tanuri now, Zygentus, and we all get to live. Live to kill each other another day, crackled Shabaka. She wants it. She is the pebble that starts the avalanche. Speak plainly, demanded Zygentus. Who wants what? Pebbles? Avalanches? Who are you talking about? Her! screeched Shabaka, pointing past Tanuri to the slight figure of Misha. She is the mote light in the eye of the gods. Misha held the Chalikar tight to her chest, like a child clutching her father's blade. Sabotaru snarled and hauled Tanuri to his feet. The wolf's psyche was slender, yet monstrously powerful and wrought with four sinew grey furred arms curled into clawed fists. What are they talking about? He growled. That one, who is she? Tanri bit back a scream of pain as the twisted bones in his spine grounded together. She's immortal, nothing more, he said. You always were a miserable liar, said Sabotaru, bearing long crooked fangs. The truth, brother, or I will rip your throat out before you can blink. She helped me find the Chalikar, said Tanri. Sabotaru shook his head. The scholar buried the Chalikar with Sataka when he took her body into hiding. After the doom of Ikathia, how is it that the mere mortal knew where to find it? She did not, but she led me to Nasus. The others forgot Zuyan and turned their attention to Tanuri. You saw the scholar? said Valiva, the spines on her back rippling with anticipation. No one has seen him since he killed Monira for delving the charred ruins of Nashrami's great library. I saw him, but he is much changed since we last knew him. Whatever burden he bears has all but crushed him. He dwells at a tower raised on a hidden cliff, watching the dance of stars. He bade her find me and bring me to his tower. Why you? His Naganeka. Why not any of us? I do not, said Tanri. There are many more deserving of his attention. And you spoke to him? Asked Enkai. I did, said Tanri. And he told you where to find Setaka's blade? Yes, just like that? Sped Syphax. No, not just like that, Tanri snapped, throwing off Sabotaru's grip. He turned to retrieve the Chalikar from Misha. The power within the weapon was potent and restless. I told him of our war, of how we were burning paradise and glowing at one another like animals. I told him I needed the weapon of Setaka to end this bloodshed. Nasus rejected us the moment Azir fell, said Zygentus. Why would he help now? He rejected the Sunborn because he saw the bitter jealousies 
and twisted rivalries that fester in our hearts, said Tannery. He has been walking the forgotten paths of his world, wrecked by grief and adrift in memories of his lost brother. But always he is drawn back to the land of his birth. Tannery took a breath, grimacing as he felt the currents of magic shifting within him. Sharp pain stepped up into his heart from his belly. So, the end begins. Misha had warned him that using the magic she had taught him would irreversibly change even as Sandit, breaking the feathers that bound the immortal breath of the gods to his human flesh. That power had held the hurts of endless battle and the passage of millennia at bay. But some things were never meant to live forever. Fear touched him then, cold and unfamiliar, but he fought down the creeping tide of pain and weakness. You are right, Zygantus. Nasus will never fight in our war, but that does not mean he is heedless in what we do. He told me the stars speak of a time far in the future when Shurima will rise from the sands once more, when the rightful ruler will fight to claim dominion over all that has been lost. Shurima will rise again, said Sabotaru, unable to mask his eagerness. When? We will not live to see it, said Tanuri. Not all of us. Shabake pushed her scrawny, skittering form between them. Her withered arms stabbed the air, her dark eyes wide. All of us may die today, or just some! She screeched. Syphex pushed her away. The Chalikar, he said. It will play part in Shurima's rebirth? Yes, said Tanuri. For good or ill, it will be a symbol for the people of Shurima to rally behind. I had hoped it could heal the wounds between us. A reminder of what we once were, and what we could be again. It could have saved us if we had taken the chance to reclaim the brotherhood that had once bound us together under a single banner. Sabotaro grunted in amusement. And now the truth of it comes out. You gathered us here to claim the right of leadership, bearing the weapon of our great champion, and anointed by the scholar himself. Tanri shook his furred head. No. I could never be the equal to Setaka or Nasus. All I sought was the end of this war. I had hoped we could do it together, but I see now that was an impossible dream. Tanri walked away from his brethren, moving to stand in the center of the amphitheater. All eyes were upon him, eight god warriors and thousands of mortals. The pain was spreading all through him, almost too much to bear. He swallowed, tasting the grit of sand in the back of his throat. Fur was drifting free from his body in wispy clumps. Every moment felt like broken glass was grinding in his joints. He turned to address others. Power without check made us vain, made us believe that nothing should be denied us. That made us poor stewards of his world, and we do not deserve to be its masters. We once called ourselves the Ascended Host, but what are we now? Darkin? A name debased by mortals who no longer understand what we are, or what we were brought to do? He lifted his fading eye to the thousands watching from the steps of the amphitheater, tears cutting a path through his flanking skin. They hate us, and when the horrors of the abyss rise once more, they will beg us for our return, said Tanri, meeting Misha's eager gaze. But we will be gone, no more than whispers on the song winds. A dark legend of imperfect gods told to scold disobedient children. With the last of his strength, Tanri rammed the Chalikar down into the crystalline floor of the amphitheater. The sound was deafening, like a hammer blow against the wail of the world. The cracks of its impact spread further than they should have. The clear sky burned with the diamond brilliance of a newborn star. But this was no golden radiance. This was cold, merciless and silver. What the sun made, the moon will unmake, screamed Stannery, and a blazing column of white fire stabbed from the midnight sky. It struck the Chalikar's extended arms and reflected that fire outwards, drawing in the god warriors and piercing their chests. It burned them, reached into the arcane hearts of their beings and devoured the magic that made them. Shabaka and Shabake vaporized instantly, disappearing in an ashen cloud of drifting feathers. Their screams were crackles of release, fried it with resigned foreknowledge. Syphex twisted in the light like a hooked fish, but even his power was meaningless in the face of this cosmic fire. The bull-headed Zygantus tried to run, but not even his legendary speed could outrun the moonfall called down by Tannery. 
even as his skin slowed from his bones. Tanri wept to see them die. They were his brothers and sisters, and not even centuries of the most brutal war imaginable could make him hate them. He saw Enkai unmade by the radiance, his divine flesh dissolving into light from his bones. He reached for Tanri, and his eyes were accepting as he met his fate. He sobbed at what he was forced to do. The light burned away his remaining eye, and the world of darkness closed in on him. The last of his strength fled his body and he slumped to the glass floor of the amphitheater. He heard more screams and the shouts of fighting men who knew nothing of the affairs of gods. More bloodshed, but it would pass. Would the mortal host continue the war his kind had begun? Perhaps, but it would be a mortal war, and it would end. And so, with the Sunborn Annihilate, it was peace really brought back? No, of course not. Not all of them were here. Where's Rast? Where's Aatrox? Where's Varus? What about his sister? Is she really the Ascended that looks like Snake that escaped? Or was she also annihilated here? Is there truly only five Dark in missing? Or is there more? And what about the aspect of Twilight? Why did she use Tannery? Did he not kill enough of his brethren? Was he not helpful enough? Is the corruption of the Void really unstoppable? Are the Ascended inevitably doomed? We're not done yet. Tanri drifted in darkness, lost in memories of happier days. He tried to recall his life before climbing up the golden steps to meet the sun with Enkai. Little remained of that time. The memories shed as the heavenly power had crowded his skull. Tanri heard footsteps, booted feet crunching over broken glass. He smelled mortal flesh, rank with sweat and decay. They were smells he recognized, his life bearers. Tanri lifted a hand, seeking to touch another living being, but no one took it. Shulpei, he croaked. Is that you? Tushpa? Idrimai? Please help me. I think... I think I'm a mortal once more. I... I, I think I'm a human again. You are, said a voice that seemed on the verge of laughter. Misha, whispered Tanri. Are they all dead? No. Naganeka, Valiva and Sabotor were escaped before the fire could take them. But they are pretty weak, so I don't think they will be a problem for long. It's the others. All those who didn't show up who will be harder to trap. No, I must finish them, wheezed Tanri. Even a wounded god warrior could conquer this world. Trust me, said Misha. What we did here spells the beginning of the end for your kind. Then we did it. We brought peace. Then she really did laugh. Peace? Oh no. This world will never know peace. Not really. Confused, Tanri struggled to rise. But the hard jab of a spear butt to the chest pushed him back. No, you stay there, said Misha. Please, help me up, he said. I told you, I'm a human now. I heard you. But do you imagine that fact washes away your multitude of sins? Think of all the lives you ended. Does being a human now mean you're forgiven for the oceans of blood you spilled? Tell me, how many atrocities did it take before your withered conscience finally pricked you enough to act? I don't understand, Tanri murmured. What are you saying? Misha giggled and she suddenly seemed much younger to him, yet impossibly ancient too. He heard the crackling sound of the Chalikar being pulled from the amphitheater floor. I am saying that your death had been a long time coming, Tanri, said Misha. Some of you turned out not so bad, I suppose. But most of you were so damaged in the war with the Void, it's wonder you survived this long. Perhaps you and your kind were a mistake to begin with, but a mistake I can help correct. Even without eyes, Tanri felt the golden power of the Chalikar hovering just above him. Though his body was withered and all but spent, he cried out in agony as its edge split his chest. Misha whispered into his ear. The power that coursed through this weapon touched you all, Tanri. It knows your kind now. And I give that fire to mortals. Her hands were inside him, and Tanri felt his heart being cut away felt it being lifted from the cage of his cloven ribs. Yet, still he lived, for a few more moments at least. Idrimai, she said, handing off Tanri's heart. 
Take this and the Chalikar to your weaponsmiths. We will need to take a different approach in dealing with the rest of the... Misha paused. Wait, what was the old word? She snapped her fingers. Ah yes, that's it. Darkin. But that's it for this video! So many awesome things happened and so many questions were brought up. For example, who really is the aspect of Twilight here? Is Misha Zoe? Is it possible that Misha would hide her real name? Their descriptions are very similar, but their behaviors are quite different. Also, the title is Trickster. And on top of that, if Misha did not die here, how did she die? How did she become Zoe? There are so many awesome things to think about. Also, if you are still confused about the appearance of the Darkin, remember that they learned the forbidden magics after they were touched by the Void. Meaning that they can probably shape their flesh because of the Void, and that's exactly how the Void does it. Either way, if you like this story and this video, feel free to like it. And you can also follow us on our social media, Twitch, Merch and PO Box. Link to those will be in the description. Of course, massive shout out to our patrons for going the extra mile. You guys are absolutely amazing. And with that, thank you all so much for being here. And as always, thank you come again.